By both means equality. Liboto significa igualdad. My vote is courage. My vote means human rights belong to everyone. My vote is important because it gives me a voice. My vote means access to housing for all people, but especially queer and trans people and people living with HIV. My vote means having a seat at the table. It counts as a vote for me and my community. My vote means I participated in the democratic process with a candidate I believed in. My vote is my weapon. It is one of many powerful tools in my arsenal, and it will continue to fight against racism, white supremacy, oppression, and the ignorant. My vote means courage to stand in line to go vote, to create change. My vote means accountability. My vote is resilience. Using my vote will count for everybody else who is disadvantaged and may not have the opportunity or the will to vote. My vote is power. My vote means that I am ensuring my voice, my wants, and my needs are being heard and counted. Please be safe and vote for as soon as we can because we need a change and we need equality because every human deserves it to be equal. So, por favor, vota por el cambio y por la igualdad. Gracias. My vote is important to me because it gives me the opportunity to use my voice and my rights to fight for things that we have not been able to fight for for the last 30, 40, 50 years. My vote means to me that I'm able to succeed and get my dream. My vote is everything. My vote means that I continue to be free and have a voice amongst a world where I have none. Hi everyone, welcome to My Voice is, or My Vote is My Voice. My name is Ashley Marie Preston. I am the founder of You Are Essential, which funds grassroots organizations serving vulnerable communities impacted by food insecurity, housing instability, and barriers to access. And if I were to assign an adjective to my vote, I would have to say that my vote is transformative. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Alfonso David. I am the president of the Human Rights Campaign, which is the largest LGBTQ civil rights organization in the country and around the world. If I had to classify my vote, I couldn't find one adjective, but I would say my vote is precious, it's sacred, and it's my voice. It is so great to be here today, here with you, Ashley, as we kick off this partnership between the Human Rights Campaign Foundation and the National Trans Visibility March to get out the vote this November. I definitely am excited about this conversation and about this series altogether. So for those of you who don't know, this is the first of a three-part series and we're gonna be ending in a virtual national march on October the 3rd. Many of you were a part of the one that we had in Washington DC last year and it was, I'm still trying to reduce the goosebumps that are still running up and down my spine every time I think about the show of solidarity and unity and the way that we turned it up and more than anything, the way that we held community together. Because I think that this isn't just about voting and specifically just to um, do a chore, it's about how we come together when we do that. So. Definitely excited about that. And just to give you kind of like a briefing of what to expect today, we're going to talk about uh, why it's important to vote. The conversation is also going to include some of the barriers to voting. Um, also, myth busting, because we know the girls like to swap lies and tell lies on the internet. So we're going to make sure that we break through some of that so that y'all know what's true and what's false, and you're able to take full advantage of your vote this November. So um, without um, any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and also kick it over to Alonzo to lead the way. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. I'm also thrilled to be partnering with you and the March to address this vital issue. As many people know, transgender people have been on the forefront of our movement 
the LGBTQ movement, as well as the civil rights movement. But unfortunately, transgender people have been sidelined and they're still sidelined when it comes to voting. It is not only wrong, it's immoral and it's illegal. And we're going to try to help, it's not going to try to help anyone win an election. We have to make sure that we break down the barriers to voting. Our ancestors fought to make sure that we have the right to vote, all of us. Black people, Latinx people, immigrants that, are, that uh, um, become residents in this country have the ability to actually vote in this country. But unfortunately, we see all too often barriers are created that make it so difficult for people to vote. So what we want to do, as Ashley said, is make sure we demystify the process, break down the barriers, and make sure that you can exercise your constitutional right to vote. And it's also not just about voting. It's about participating. I'm actually the first trans person in California to run for state office. And one of the things that was important for me was not just about, I'm the kind of girl, so I have a little bit of like control issues. I will own that. And so I don't always like to send everyone in to like do what I know needs to be done. Like I hope that we have better allies and I hope that more of these organizations pick it up and get it together and show up for trans folks. But at the end of the day, sometimes no one can do it better than we can. And I wanna point out that we have trans folks who are running for stuff all across the country. I know that we have Andrea Jenkins and Philippe Cunningham in Minneapolis serving on the city council. We got folks on the legislature in Virginia. We got way too many trans folks running for office for many different seats, way too many that I can remember and acknowledge at this moment. So shout out, no shade, we see you. Um, but I think it's about more than just, again, the action of voting, but it's about really committing ourselves to these conversations that directly impact our lives. Um, so with that being said, we want to just go ahead and address some of the barriers and talk about those and how we confront those barriers and move forward so that, again, we can exercise our right to vote. Yep. So why don't we start with one of the biggest myth busters here, identity documents. According to research from the Williams Institute, nearly one million transgender people are eligible to vote in the 2020 general election nearly 1 million transgender people are eligible to vote. But of all of these possible voters, nearly 380,000 do not have identity documents to reflect their correct name and gender. 380,000. And 81,000 live in states with strict voter, strict photo identification laws, I should say. Our research shows that 42% of transgender voters have faced identification obstacles in prior elections that prevent voting. So we all know that in 2016, all of us are still traumatized from 2016. But let me just give you a fact to, to, to give you a little bit more context. In 2016, the election hung on fewer than 80,000 votes in three states. 80,000 votes in three states. I just referenced we have 81,000 people who live in states with strict voter ID laws. And I also mentioned that we have nearly 380,000 who don't have IDs to reflect their correct uh, name or gender. So we know that these barriers are real. And we know that we can make a huge difference in the outcome of an election. So what do you do about it? We know that these laws are strict. We know that these obstacles exist. We know that this happened in 2016. The first thing you can do is go to hrc.org backslash vote. hrc.org backslash vote. What will you find on that site? You can check to see if you're registered. You can check to make sure that your name matches the name on your registration. Because so much of this is dependent on what state you live in, you can also learn about your own state's laws. And as we know, we're living through a global pandemic. So any changes that are made during COVID-19, we want to make sure that you're aware of that. You can also learn about vote by mail options. We've all heard about this slogan, vote by mail. Well, vote by mail can be incredibly useful, um, especially if you're worried about COVID-19, if you have a weakened immune system, or if you have identification barriers. 
Second, in addition to going to www.hrc.org backslash vote, we want you to know that your gender presentation does not have to match your ID. I'll say that again. Your gender presentation does not have to match what's on your ID. Now, even though that is a fact, it does not prevent bias by poll workers. So you have to know what your rights are. If you show up at a polling station on election day, do not let them send you home. I'll say that again. If you show up at a polling station on election day, do not let them send you home. You always have the right to request a provisional ballot. You always have the right to request a provisional ballot. There are also lawyers at the National Voter Hotline, and it's 866-OUR-VOTE, 866-OUR-VOTE, and those lawyers are available to help. So on election day, you show up at a polling station and they say, oh, your identification that you just handed us does not match how you're presenting to us. Do not leave. You can get a provisional ballot and you can call one of the lawyers at the National Voter Hotline. And those are some of the tools that we wanna make sure we communicate tonight. So people don't think, well, if my ID does not correspond with my how I express myself, I can't vote because they will force me to leave the polling stations. Don't do that. You have resources that are, resources that are indeed available to you. Ashley, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you for that. And I also just want to make it very clear because sometimes there is um, a conflation of provisional ballot with an absentee ballot. And so there is a lot of overlap in what some of those things can mean. But just for those who may not know, a provisional ballot just means that they are having trouble verifying your identity. And then they can, you can vote, but that vote may or may not count. So I think that the goal when we're talking about provisional ballots is to make sure that we can somehow um, look to absentee ballots or to mail-in ballots or non-proved ballots, as they call it in some states, there's different language to describe a mail-in ballot sometimes, but understanding that, um, again, part of voter suppression sometimes is getting people put in positions where they have to submit a provisional ballot over the, the, over the ballot that they're entitled to when there is no discrepancy about who you are, they're just playing the girls. And so, um, I think that for those folks who may be uh, watching who are a part of other organizations, maybe this is the conversation that we need to have in a community about how we put our organizations to work so that we can make sure that we're not only educating uh, voters about their options, but maybe that we're creating environments that make it safe. And so I just briefly want to talk about what my experience was. Everything that you said about don't leave, they tried to play me in the early 2000s when I was homeless and I went to um, to a polling site and, you know, she was disheveled. I had the same clothes on for a week and, you know, I was homeless. And But the thing is that I knew that I still had a right to be there, you know? And so I was getting stares because, you know, some of the folks probably knew that I was trans. And then also I was getting treated like crap because people, they were just looking at me because I was visibly homeless. And so someone had went and complained. And then one of the workers came over and was like, um, do you have what you need? This is a polling site. So basically they act like that I was just like a grizzly bear wandering through the woods trying to find a snack in a warm cabin. And I had to let them know that <laughs> I know what this is. Um, in fact, my ancestors, you know, I'm still black. My ancestors fought so that I can be here. So not only do I know what this is, but I think that it's my duty to be here. And so they tried to, it was this whole brouhaha. And, but at the end of the day, I refused to leave. And luckily for me, I had other friends with me. So we came together. So that is another thing that I would recommend so that it is a pandemic right now. We don't know what it's going to look like. More will be revealed. It's going to continue to develop. But just know that you have a right to be there. If they give you any problems, you can always ask to speak to um, a supervisor on site. So usually the person that you're directly interacting with isn't always the lead for that site. And if that doesn't work, 
you know, you can um, ask to speak to the registrar. So there is a phone number. It's 866-OUR-VOTE. So make sure that you lean into that. Um, and again, tell them what's going on. And so the registrar can actually verify your identity and then push everything through. So you can go ahead, cast your vote and keep it pushing. So I think that the ultimate thing here is just not to let anyone intimidate you or bully you out of accessing your right to vote. And just to reiterate everything Alfonso said, um, it's really just about understanding that there are people in your corner. They aren't doing you any favors by letting you hold space. Um, and we also know that I, um, that day when I was trying to cast a vote, somebody was like, well, you know, this is, they try to say something about property and they can call the police or the, well, girl, call them mama. Cause I'm not going nowhere. You know? <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. And so the beautiful thing is that there were other folks there who also made sure that I had that right. So know your rights and um, we'll be continuing to talk more about what those rights look like. Absolutely. And, and for some people, uh, oh, this is a cultural reference. If you haven't seen this film, please see it. It's Selma, uh, Ava DuVernay's great film about Martin Luther King. In that film, uh, Oprah Winfrey plays a civil rights activist who shows up to vote multiple times. She was registered to vote. She had the legal right to vote. And each time she showed up, they gave her a new test. She, need, she needed to recite certain provisions of the Constitution. She needed to recite certain provisions of the Bill of Rights. You don't have to do any of that. When, you have the, when you're registered to vote, you have the right to vote. Don't allow them to create additional barriers. Um, and some people may not know that they may think, well, in order to vote, if you're voting for the first time, I have to answer additional questions. I have to tell you who the governor of the state is. I have to tell you how many members of Congress represent my state. No, you don't have to answer any of those questions. You have a constitutional right to vote. And if they start creating barriers, call that number, call the lawyers, and make sure that we can provide you with support that you need to, to exercise your right to vote. And, and what we're talking about today is not just about the myths of voting, but there's some real barriers, especially in this time of COVID-19. So things should be getting better, but they're not. And I want to just briefly talk about becoming a poll worker. So all of us know when we show up to vote, there are people there who administer the process of voting. I'm not going to get into the pros and cons of it because in some cases it's horrendous. But if you're a poll worker, it's a paid opportunity in many states. And what I think we want to also encourage people uh, uh, about is maybe this is an opportunity for you to serve as a poll worker, to make sure that you're in the position of representing uh, other constituents in your state, to make sure that people actually have their rights vindicated. And if you're interested in being a poll worker, you can go to your state election website. All of them are different, but if you just Google your state, just put state election and your state, the name of your state into whatever the search engine is, you'll find the website, you can learn about how to become a poll worker. And by just by doing that, we always talk about how important rep representation is. And if we can have people like us, marginalized communities who are also serving as poll workers, we can also hopefully affect change there. You can also make sure, and, and I said before, please go to hrc.org backslash vote to make sure you're registered to vote. Many people assume that they're registered to vote because they registered 10 years ago. They registered 20 years ago. But we know that some of the, the, the voting uh, roles have been purged in some states, unconstitutionally, by the way, but nevertheless, some of them have been purged. We wanna make sure that you find out just get online and make sure that you're registered to vote and make sure that you stay on top of rules in your state. If you need support, we have resources to give you a support, but I also just wanna make sure you don't assume that you're registered to vote in some states where folks are playing games and we know they're playing games and we wanna make sure you have the opportunity to actually exercise your right to vote. This is really about making sure that you know your rights and you are not fooled when you show up to the polling station. 
Absolutely. And I mean, foolery is <laughs> the name yeah. of the game. Um, I know that I'm always telling people, many of us saw some of those documentaries about uh, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and the ways in which social media is sometimes weaponized against us in ways that try to suppress our vote and our understanding of what's happening. And so I just want to, especially to my Gen Z, Gen Alpha folks, consider the source, consider, let's please consider where we're getting our news. Um, unfortunately, Facebook is not always a viable source for news. Sometimes Twitter is not, Instagram. It's really important to check in with your state and local agencies. Um, many of them have government websites. So if it has .gov at the end, you, you can typically trust that. Um, some of the organizations that are committed to LGBTQ equality, you can trust those sites. And if all else fails, um, again, ask, ask someone, you know, about their process, but then we also know, sometimes our friends don't know. And I just wanna make it very clear that the reason why we're having this conversation and the reason why it's going to be uh, more than one um, episode or um, it's gonna be a series is because we have to get past this fear of not knowing, okay? I know that I have made a lot of strides in the political sphere as someone who's trans and being able to be a part of these conversations, but I didn't get into politics until 2015. And it's because I was too ashamed and embarrassed to tell somebody that I don't know what, is it a ballot? Is it a poll? Is it a, what is gonna be there when I look at it? I didn't know that a ballot is just telling you who's running, what their issues are that they're running on. Um, and us essentially being able to select which one feels right for us. I also got into groups. Like I know that there was this really cool trend that was happening during the midterm because I had never voted in a midterm. I have only voted one midterm and that was in, um, 2018. And we had these cool pods where we started talking about the issues where we were like, okay, this is this person. This is what they're running for. This is what that means to you. Because I know for me, honey, I'm uh, I'm a girl from the boulevard. So ex-survival sex worker here. So I'm still of the mindset, what's in it for me? Okay. So I need to know what's in it for me. And so what was in it for me was people just being able to break that down. Because we know that sometimes the way we talk about politics is stale and boring. And we already know that there is a deep distrust with trans folks. We know that people like to use us as puppets. We know that people like to exploit our stories and our narratives. And they like to play off and rift off of the trauma porn that happens in our lives. And so rightfully so, you have a right to be suspicious. But what I will tell you is that you also have a responsibility to show up and not only claim space, but tell your own story through the ballot because nobody can tell your story better than you can. And so even though we know that we have allies and we have organizations and all of this, we have to look out for our own and take care of ourselves. So with that being said, I wanna open up the space because we wanna make sure that if you have questions, those questions are getting answered. And we wanna make sure that we don't just give you a simple answer. We're gonna make sure that in these upcoming parts of the series, we continue to reiterate those answers so that other people who may not have been able to make it to this call or who may have um, the same questions coming up, that they have access to that. So with that being said, I wanna open it up to community because this is really for y'all and I want y'all to have a sense of ownership to know that this is about you. So does anybody uh, from the audience have any questions or anything they need clarification on? So I am looking right now to see if we have any questions that have come in so far. Um, Somebody said, how do you know if you are registered again? That's a good question. Alfonso, do you want to take that one? Sure. So again, I think one of the easiest things to do is just to get on the website, hrc.org backslash vote, and find out if you're registered. You can get online and see whether or not you've been registered. You can get all of the information about when. You can also see how you're actually classified for purposes of voting, your specific name that's listed. 
and you can get all of that information online. I know for some people who've never done it before, it seems like that's impossible to find out, but you actually can figure that out. It's very straightforward to get online and see when was I registered, how am I listed, where am I registered to vote, which is just as important as this is all too true, you know, many people have moved around over the course of their lives. And maybe you registered in New York, but now you live in California. Or maybe you registered in Florida, but now you live in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis. Make sure that your registration corresponds with where you are, because sometimes we forget where we registered to vote and we need to make sure we align those. And you can get that easily online. And please do it now. We love an expedient queen. Do it now. Do not put it off. Um, if you're anything like me, we all are looking at a million and one distractions from the time we get up to the time we go to bed and time creeps up. Just do it now. Don't put it off. So be sure to check out that website. Again, it was hrc.org forward slash vote. Um, and just double check and make sure that you have that because we also want to make sure that you have enough time to get the support that you need so that you're not rushing. And then when we're rushing and we're frustrated and we're tired, we're just like, I ain't got time for this. I'm trying to survive. I'm black and trans in America. I'm trying to survive, you know? And it's just like, well, we want to make sure that we have that time for everyone, no matter what background you're from, if you're trans, non-binary, how we want to make sure that we have the resources and social support that we need to make sure that our vote gets counted. And, and I know this question has not been asked, but I've gotten it so many times that I think is worth answering. And the question is, well, I'm not really that excited about who's running for president. So why do I have to vote? Ashley, do you want to take that question? <laughs> oh, of course, <laughs> because uh, I've related to that. Um, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and what I do know is that we have to divorce ourselves from this notion or idea that once we've cast the vote, our work is done. Because the truth is that it does not matter who you voted for if your candidate is, um, you know, makes all the rounds and ends up in the Oval Office. The truth is that we all have a social responsibility to keep them accountable. And so this isn't just about one-off participation, casting a vote one time. It's really about being consistent and keeping open that line of communication and building relationships because we want members of our community to be on a first name basis with a lot of these folks. And I know some of y'all are like, they don't know who I am. They don't even care who I am. They We've been seeing a lot of instances, especially the ways in which the social ecology has shifted, that there are lawmakers and um, people who are running in these races who, did, who do care. And they are sitting down with us and they are having these conversations. And so just knowing that you, no one needs for you to necessarily uh, be ridiculously chipper or over the top enthusiastic. We just need for you to be active because there is a lot on the line. And I don't know about you, but I need to have a say so when it comes to how I'm able to access healthcare. I need to have a say so when it comes to my ability or inability to access shelter based on my gender identity or whatever social support or services I would need that cisgender people wouldn't even have as much of a barrier to access and getting. I need to have a say so in the ways in which I have access to employment and if there is any abuse of that power, what the follow up uh, consequence is to that. I need to be able to have a say so in all of those things. And so the thing is that somebody once told me and I was ready to fight when they told me that, like I'm not even gonna lie to y'all, like I was hot. But somebody told me, they were like, girl, if you forfeit your right to vote, you forfeit the right to complain. And so the mm -hmm. thing is that we need to be able to, and I'm really talking to my uh, social justice activist fam too, because keeping it real, I've had conversations with a lot of my sisters, brothers, and others, and they're like, girl, the system is broken and this and that. And so why should we even care? And it's like, first of all, the system is not broken. It's operating the way that it was designed to. Oh, Long as we're on the same page, I want to make sure that we're on the same. I need you to hear me lean all the way in. 
it is operating the way that it was designed to. And so really the questions that we should be asking ourselves is how do we get in? You know, how do we, and not that political, uh, uh, that political participation is the end all be all, but it's definitely a huge chunk of how we do this. So one of the things I loved about John Lewis, we talked about him briefly, is that he was uh, innovative in that he didn't just wait for change to greet him at the front door. He accessed it from the side windows, the back door, the chimney, everywhere. We need folks on the ground, in these offices, all of that. So with that being said, true liberation and change comes from employing all of your resources and voting is no exception to that rule. Oh, hallelujah. And I'll just say, because I know we've been talking a lot about police brutality. I know we've been talking about Black Lives Matter. I know we've been talking about Black Trans Lives Matter. If you care only about criminal justice issues and nothing else, vote. You get to decide who is going to be elected mayor, who's going to be elected city council. Just making those two choices, you get to decide whether or not police departments are funded in the way that you want them to be funded and who gets to be elected or appointed, I should say, as the police chief. So there's so many choices that we have to make in exercising our right to vote. I don't want to sort of get into the weeds here because we're really focusing on making sure you can register to vote. We're not telling you who to vote for, but we want to make sure that you understand the importance of your vote and that's your voice. Yes, we've been using our voice to protest, and it is just as important. But if we don't follow through with voting, we can't affect change. And that's why this is so important. With all of the barriers that exist, and they have existed for decades, Ashley mentioned this because I think it is worth saying again. We are fighting against a system that was intentionally designed to oppress people, marginalize people, people of color, LGBTQ people. And we can't change that system. We can't change that paradigm unless we participate in changing it. If we decide to sit it out, we are in effect perpetuating an existing system that oppresses us. And I know many of us have voted in prior elections and we didn't like the result. I'm one of them, but we have to be vigilant and we have to exercise our right to vote. Taylor Chandler Walker asked a really good question. Um, they said, will there be info or links or are there voting records of candidates and how it affected trans or LGBTQ rights protections, et cetera, in the past? Because you know we love receipts. So I'll go, where, where can we find these receipts? Yes, so they are receipts. Now, the Human Rights Campaign has uh, something called the Congressional Scorecard. It's all online. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign has been tracking the voting records of elected officials who are sitting in Congress or have sat in Congress for years. And so we rank their scores and determine whether or not they're supportive of LGBTQ issues, they're supportive of immigrants' rights issues, they're supportive of women's issues, uh, and it, it runs the gamut. So you can get online and get all of those reports and see whether or not elected officials are actually supporting LGBTQ issues. That is one proxy for congressional candidates that may be seeking reelection. Another proxy is that many organizations that endorse candidates. And when we endorse candidates, we specify why we're endorsing those candidates and we talk about their respective records. Some of that information is also online. The Human Rights Campaign is one organization that provides information to voters so that they can vote, but also provides information to voters so that they're informed about their votes. And you can get that information as well online. Uh, to be clear though, there are some instances where we don't have specific information on every single local election. For example, we don't have information about school boards, or we may not have information about city councils, but there are other organizations, local organizations that do this work as well, and they have that information posted uh, as well. So in addition to the Human Rights Campaign, there are a variety of other organizations that do it. I would start with the Human Rights Campaign and specifically focusing on congressional candidates, and then we can also provide you with resources for other organizations that do this work. And I got a quick question before we move on to the next question. Um, what if someone uh, has information or concerns about a candidate? Are they able to submit that? Because I'm gonna keep it all the way G-code. 
there has been times when I've seen scores and I'm like, really, sis? Really? They, the, like, they got a high score and we know that they've been out here dogging trans folks and doing all this. And then I've also seen the conversation shift, right? Where, like, somebody somebody from HRC was like, got it, and it was done. So um, how does that happen? Like, how does community provide feedback on that? Or is it only an internal process? It is not an internal process. It's actually, we get information from a variety of sources to inform whether and who we endorse for can't, for elections. I would suggest that people provide that information to us. And I don't want to give an email out that uh, is inaccurate. So before we end this, we will make sure we have online uh, the specific email address we will forward people to. So you can provide that information to us. Thank you so much. Next question comes from Ivan Love, who asks, if someone has issues at the polling center, how do you push it forward? And um, they're on the live now. So I would say, again, um, at the polling center, I think that the thing you don't want to do is let them shoo you away and tell you that they'll give you a call or that they'll have someone call you because you'll be waiting for a very, 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 very very long time. They're not going to call. <laughs> They're not going to call Ivan. So I think, again, going back to what we were saying earlier is um, making sure that you do not leave until you've been able to cast your vote. Um, again, accessing um, the registrar, which is 866-OUR-VOTE, I believe is, is the phone number. Yes. Um, and then asking to speak to someone, you know, who can give a little bit more insight. And whatever you do, and I know that we get tired. I'm just going to speak for the Black folks on the call. Uh, we get tired of having to um, code switch or to kind of like over, over guard how we communicate for fear that we're going to make somebody upset or make someone feel that, uh, that we're being threatening or angry. Those are things that come up. But I do want to say, to the best of our ability, we know what they're doing. We know that gaslighting is real. And for those of you who don't know what gaslighting is, it's when someone plays psychological games with you to make you doubtful of your own reality and what's happening in that moment. And so I've seen instances and heard stories where people have tried to literally start confrontations and then make it look like we were being problematic simply because we asked for someone. So basically just ask, you know, you know that they're busy and they're doing a million and one things, which is really true. You know, the poll workers, they do a lot of amazing work. And so just asking them, I'm going to let you do you. And then let me maybe talk to somebody who can answer some in-depth questions. So then you're talking to a supervisor and then, you know, if they don't help you with what you need, then definitely reach out to the registrar. But again, the key is do not leave out casting your vote. And uh, before we go to the next question, Ashley, I just want to give that email address for folks if they have concerns about certain candidates or they just want to give us their opinions on certain candidates who we may be endorsing. Uh, the email address is feedback at hrc.org. Again, that, that email address is feedback at hrc.org. Fantastic. And so we're going to go to, to the next question now. Do we have... Well, while we're waiting on the next question, I know one that often comes up is, again, like, can you vote if you're homeless? The answer is yes, I was homeless. Um, I know that at the time there was a shelter that I had an address for. And at that program, they were actually working with us um, around the election to make sure that we could vote. Um, I understand that some cities and states may not have that opportunity um, to do so. So um, obviously reaching out to, again, to your uh, state or local office and asking them what your options are and they should be able to um, include that information for you. And I also want to address something that's a huge one, and I feel that I would be remiss if I didn't talk about it. And that question is, what about folks with past felony convictions? Can you vote if you are a convicted felon? And the answer is yes, sometimes. There are stipulations, um, and I'm going to let Alfonso also add on to that, but 
we do know that for those who may not know, the basic voting requirement is that you're 18 years old or and that you're a U.S. citizen. Um, and beyond that, some states, as a means of voter suppression, have made it to where you may have some barriers to voting because of your past uh, convictions. And I first, really, really quick, want to name something because, you know, some of us, you know, we like to play with data. So uh, <laughs> basically, um, there was a study that was done on um, how many uh, cases of voter suppression or, or, or voter fraud have actually took place. And there were some numbers that were submitted by the Heritage Foundation. And so we know that in 20 years, that there's been over 250 million um, voting ballots that were mailed in. Of that 250 million voting ballots, there were only 1,285 proven cases of voter fraud and only 1,100 um, uh, convictions because of it. So again, there is no real data or numbers to justify this whole voter ID. We have to prove that you're not trying to scam anybody or you know defraud the government. Or it's not about that because we clearly see that there haven't even really been that many cases. But again, to make sure that we have all of the information, I'm going to kick it over to Alfonso so he can talk to you about what your voting options are if you are someone who's been convicted of a felony. So a little bit of background. Um, this is a vestige of discrimination and slavery, uh, where the prison industrial complex were, was created in, in part and, and metastasized over the years as a way to suppress the vote, suppress the vote of marginalized communities. And in some states, you still have the vestiges of those laws on the books. But I'll just give you what the laws are in maybe three or four different buckets. So there are some states where if you have been convicted of a felony, you never lose your right to vote, even if you are incarcerated. Uh, Maine is an example, Vermont is another example. You never lose your right to vote. The second example are states where if you've committed a felony, you lose your rights only while you're incarcerated. And after you are released and you receive automatic restoration of your voting rights, there are 16 states, including the District of Columbia, where felons lose their rights, their voting rights, and they gain those back after they are released. And then there are the third category of states, and there are about 20 plus states or so, where if you've been convicted of a felony, you lose your voting rights during incarceration and for a period of time after, which typically means while you're on parole or probation. And then there are the last category of states, there are about 11 or so of those states, where if you've been convicted of a felony, you lose your voting rights indefinitely for some crimes. You never get them back. Or it requires that the governor of that state has to pardon you in order for you to have your voting rights restored. So you need to know which state you live in and where, which state you're gonna vote in, I'm sorry. And uh, based on those state's laws, we will be able to tell you whether or not you can vote. Some of that information is on the website of the Human Rights Campaign. You can also get that information on the National Conference of State Legislatures. They have that posted online and it's very easy. They categorized it very easy and you can get that information and understand what your options are. But it really does depend on where you vote, where you live. Thank you so much. I think that that is, I think that again, it's so relieving just to know that we have options, you know, and that, and not only that, that those options didn't come easy. Y'all, somebody had to die, literally die for us to be able to have the right to vote. Somebody had to be beaten up taken to jail, as my mama would say in Kentucky, thrown under the jail, <laughs> just so we could be able to access this right to vote. And so like, I think that um, I recently did, uh, did a piece recently um, for a media outlet talking about um, John Lewis and the legacy. So for many of you who don't know, John Lewis was the youngest of the uh, big six organizers for the um, the march on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Bayard Rustin, all of these like historical uh, black civil rights uh, movement leaders, right? And so 
it was called uh, Bloody Sunday. We know it as Bloody Sunday, but in 1965, they went to lead almost 600 um, peaceful demonstrators from Selma to Montgomery for the right to vote and to talk about the importance of it because Black men had actually been able to technically vote since the late 1800s, but the Ku Klux Klan and uh, the police and all of these um, groups were trying to intimidate them and bully them out of voting. And so finally, we were like, not only are we not going to continue to allow ourselves to be bullied out of the right to vote, but we're also going to make sure that it includes everyone even, because at that time, not even Black women could vote, even though white women had been given the right to vote from the suffragette movement, uh, from the, the suffrage movement, we didn't have that, right? And so um, they crossed that bridge, and honey, when I tell you that the uh, state troopers came on horseback, they beat them with batons, they uh, beat them with bull whips, and they tear gassed them. And one person ended up dying. Um, I believe his name was Jimmy Ray. I can't remember his last name, but he was a deacon. And so literally people were battered and bruised and John Lewis was one of them. So again, understanding that there should be a sense of pride and ancestral dignity and being able to show up to the poll to make your voice heard because there were many people in many agencies and many and many of it uh, many of those groups are still functioning today that are committed to convincing you the greatest weapon of voter suppression that your voice doesn't matter and that your vote doesn't count. And Ashley, I, we just lost John Lewis, you know, less than a week ago. Friday will be a week. He was arrested 40 times. And five times when he was serving in Congress. He fought for us. He fought for us. So we need to fight for ourselves. People died, Ashley's point, people died for us. Um, and we cannot allow a broken system, a system that was created to oppress us, to allow that system to perpetuate would be desecrating on the legacy of John Lewis and everyone else who's really, he, they have fought for us to make sure that we can have our voices heard. So again, you know, we've said this over and over again because we don't want to undermine or devalue the obstacles that exist because they do exist. Ashley talked about it. They do exist, but because those obstacles exist doesn't mean that we should give up our constitutional right to vote. It's too important. I think the other piece of that too is recognizing like what that power looks like because everybody else is claiming their vote. Child, you see candidates pandering, you know, the black vote, they got the women's vote, the LGBTQ vote, the Versace lovers vote. Yeah, they got a vote for everything. So what about the trans vote? You know, and it was actually a question that I felt came up more um, as we started to see candidates who were like reading off the list of the names of trans people who have been murdered, um, predominantly black trans femmes, you know? And so just kind of thinking about what does the trans vote look like? If somebody put a microphone to your face and ask you what is crucial to your survival and your ability to thrive, what would you tell them? And I think that that answer should inform your participation and the way that you show up to the polls because I've said it before, yes, who doesn't want support? Who doesn't want help? But nobody is going to show up for the trans community the way that the trans community has the track record of showing up for ourselves. We know that Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and all of these brilliant uh, Miss Major Griffin Gracie, who's still living, all of these pioneers have done this work so that we didn't have to shrink ourselves and so that we could take up space and be unapologetic about that space that we're taking up. So understand that there was a, a, a report by the Williams Institute um, that said that there was almost a million transgender Americans who were qualified, that they were, um, they could vote. Yep. And so 
we've seen how close some of these races are. Could you imagine what a million vote sweep would look like? Could you imagine what it would look like for people not to just think that they can breeze right past the trans community and that they don't have to be accountable to us because we don't matter, because we don't show up, because we only make up a small percent of the population? Not only should we be voting, but we should also be making sure that we engage our allies and supporters to vote in our interests. Now, that's some of the other stuff that we're going to be talking about coming up soon. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and soak in everything that we've talked about. We're going to go ahead and really ask ourselves the deep, intrinsic question. My vote is, what is your vote? Feel free to go ahead and leave some of those comments um, in the, the chat thread. Let us know what your vote means. And in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and close out. We don't want to keep y'all all night. Um, but also, we have a video from last year's March. And as soon as Alfonso gives us some of his closing remarks, we're going to leave you with that. And hopefully it will inspire you to not only take up space and stand tall and firm in your resolution and in, in your dignity and sense of what you deserve, but that it will prepare you for the fight that's to come. So um, I think it's only fitting for me to quote John Lewis. In 2016, he said something that sounds as if he said it yesterday. And he said, this election presents an important challenge. The vote is precious, almost sacred. Vote like we never voted before. He said that in 2016. And we were all disappointed in 2016, but we cannot afford to be disappointed again. And our lives depend on it. We must not give up. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to do whatever we need to do to make sure that what we're hoping to see, the change that we're all hoping to see, and is, I know for some people it sounds Pollyannish, but the change that we're hoping to see is never going to be fully realized unless we're invested in that. And so I hope that you will take advantage of the resources. I hope you will engage the human rights campaign. I hope you will engage organizers from the march, Ashley, all of us, to make sure that you are empowered and you have the information that you need to make sure that your voice is heard at the ballot box. And I wanna just thank all of you for joining us tonight. And of course, thank Ashley for being so amazing in everything. Thank you so much. And really, really quick, one more thing before we cut to that video. I also wanna make sure that again, we keep this conversation ongoing. So tell us, not just in this chat thread, but offline, in your social media posts, my vote is. Will you let us know what your vote is? Be sure to tag HRC and be able to also tag Trans March DC. So that's at HRC, at Trans March DC in your video, because we want to see you. We want to see you beaming with brilliance. We want to see you. I don't want to hear you tell me what your vote is. I want to see it in you. So be sure to share those videos with us and be sure to tag HRC and Transmarch DC. The first National Trans Visibility March took place on September 28, 2019 in Washington, D.C. With over 5,300 attendees, this historic event brought together both transgender individuals and allies from all over the United States. We are tired of fighting for our country on foreign soil and then being told that we are no longer fit to serve. We are tired of our murders going without any justice and our murderers out there free. We want to be free. And that's why we, we are here. I want you to repeat after me. I am here. I am here. 
Yes, ma'am. We need to take back our narrative. We are not victims. We are not statistics. We are not tragedies. We are waiting to thrive, and this is our best year yet, because we aren't here simply to be visible. We are here to be victorious. So when we move forward today, let us press forward with purpose. Let us press forward with passion, and let us 